Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 Seafood Trade Relief Program Webinar for Fishermen. My name is Latrice Hill, and I will be your moderator for today. Today's webinar is being recorded. Uh, if for any reason you're unable to hear audio through your device, uh, there is a phone bridge available that is located in your screen. You should be able to dial in. Please know that you can type questions into the chat box. And we will try to answer as many as we can today. But please know that there is a frequently asked questions document that is available on our farmers.gov website. And if applicable, we will include your questions there. To get us started for today's discussion, I'd like to introduce to you the administrator of the Farm Service Agency who's going to bring opening remarks of welcome, Administrator Richard Fordyce. Administrator? Well, thank you, Latrice, and good afternoon, um, maybe possibly good morning to some of you. Um, uh thanks for thanks for kicking us off latrice and i know uh i know this webinar is going to be um it's going to be informative it's going to be helpful um for folks to uh to understand a little bit more about the program um you know how to participate we have uh, we spent a good bit of time and i know um um i know kelly dawson is on as the program manager for the seafood trade relief program or ctrap um, as we call it, with our acronym, um, uh, the acronyms that we use here at USDA. Uh, and so she has really dug in and, and is really doing a great job administering the program from, from a headquarter perspective. And she's going to offer uh, certainly her, um, her information and insights around the program and, and how it came about. And, I, and I, would, I would just mention just very quickly that you know that this program, um, you know, came to us literally from President Trump. Um, he had opportunities to talk to fishermen um, around the country and heard about how uh, retaliatory tariffs had affected their business. And um, he contacted our secretary, Secretary Purdue, and said we need to do something to help these folks um, with the with the with the tariff situation. And so. So this is a trade relief program. Um, we're administering uh, a number of programs right now simultaneous to this one that are, that are more COVID-19 related, but this one is specifically related to trade and retaliatory tariffs. And so there's gonna be uh, approximately $530 million uh, that fund this program. And with the number of species uh, that are eligible, um, you know, this covers a big chunk of the country. And so, um, again, I, I want to say just a huge thanks to Latrice and to Kelly um, and others that are supporting uh, the webinar today uh, to get this information out to you all um, uh, and, and to answer questions. Um, they've spent a lot of time on this as well and, um, you know, and, and are prepared to do the webinar and certainly to answer questions. Um, but, um, but, but mostly I want to say thanks to you for being on the call, for being on the webinar um, to learn more about the program. Uh, I've, I've had a couple of opportunities to visit with folks uh, about the program and, you know, and, and so the Farm Service Agency, you know, we, um, you know, we administer farm programs and disaster programs and loan programs to farmers. And so this is a little bit of a different, um, a different program for us, but, but, but I can tell you that we've taken it, uh, we've taken it head on and um, certainly learned a lot about the industry. We have more to learn and, and hopefully uh, we'll learn some, some with, uh, spending time with you today. But, but just know that we're committed to making sure that this is a success from, a, from an administrative rollout perspective. Um, but we, you know, we're going to need your help as well. So, um, so with that, I'll say again, welcome uh, to the webinar, and thanks to thanks to our staff, the folks that will be presenting today, and thanks to all of you for your interest uh, and for what you do um, to feed this country and to feed the world. So, Latrice, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you so much, Administrator Fordyce. Uh, as he stated, we are. Uh, very excited to be able to offer this program to fishermen. Uh, it is 
something that we haven't normally done. This is kind of outside of our normal farmer and rancher scene, uh, but we look forward to sharing this information with you today. Also today with me will be the National Program Manager for this program, Kelly Dawson. So she'll be joining us a little bit later. So today, what are we going to talk about? We are going to discuss the Seafood Trade Relief Program, the overview of the program. We'll also talk to you about how to apply. You know, what are the eligibility criteria? What seafood is eligible for this program? How do you apply? How many forms do you have to fill out? The application. How, do you, how will payment be calculated? And we'll also talk to you a little bit about some of the resources that are available, uh, translation services, online resources that are available. So exactly what is the Seafood Trade Relief Assistance Program? Uh, you may hear some people refer to this program as CTRAP. And when we say CTRAP, we're saying SEA, since it's dealing with seafood. Uh, as you know, USDA, we love our alphabet soup, and we love uh, speaking in a lot of different acronyms. So you may hear someone say CTRAP. They are referring to this seafood program. As the administrator stated, this is a program that came about to help U.S. fishermen who have been impacted by retaliatory tariffs from foreign governments. It is USDA's goal to provide relief to these fishermen. And it's important that you know that these are not loans. These are not program payments that you'll have to pay back unless you know there's been some type of error uh, in the payment process or some type of fraud. Uh, another question that we commonly get with uh, this program and, and other types of disaster programs, uh, is this something that uh, will be withheld by Treasury. You know, is there an administrative offset? There is no administrative offset to this program. And you do not have to be a USDA customer to apply for this. The program began on September 14th. Sign up started on the 14th. And the deadline to participate and apply is December 14th of this year. Applications for this program can be submitted to any county office, but the recording office will be where the commercial fishermen's base of operations is located. So even if they hold a federal or state license or a permit in another state, uh, such as a fisherman who resides in, let's say, Idaho during the off season, but holds a state permit or federal license issued by the state of Alaska, uh, that would be a situation where uh, they could actually apply at uh, another county office. To locate your nearest office, this is a link to an office locator. Um, a lot of you are not traditional USDA or Farm Service Agency customers, so you may not even be familiar with where our offices are located. If you just simply type in farmers.gov forward slash connect, there is an office locator that will tell you which USDA service center provides service to the area that you're located in. Because this is a non-traditional program and you're, you may not be accustomed to doing business with us, you may need some help with applying for this program. Farm Service Agency actually has a call center line that is available to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance in completing applications. What happens is you'll call this number, 1-877-508-8364, and you'll hear a recording that will ask you to press 1 for English and 2 for Spanish or any other language. At that time, you will be connected with an operator or an employee who is able to provide that language to you. But it will then lead you to press 1 for the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program or 2 for this program, the Seafood Program. 
So what you want to do, you want to call that number and press your language, and then you want to press which program, which would be seafood. Once you go through that, you will get an employee who can walk you step by step uh, with assistance in applying for this program. Now, what, what we'll talk about later uh, is a little bit about applying. Uh, there are several options available to apply for this program. You are able to apply in person at one of our service centers. You're also available to apply online. We have resources available that allow you to securely transmit and upload your application and forms directly to your county office. So we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go along. So right now I want to bring in the program manager, Kelly Dawson, who's going to talk to you a little bit more um, in the next few minutes about eligibility, um, the actual commodities that are eligible in this program, and a little bit about the application process and, and payments. Uh, but right now, let's welcome Kelly Dawson. Kelly, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Latrice, and uh, a big thank you to all of our fishermen out there. Uh, quite honestly, uh, I don't think of you much different than our farmers. You're providing uh, a precious resource to everyone out there, and I'm very happy that we're able to present this program to you. Uh, in looking at who's eligible for this program, uh, we're dealing specifically with commercial fishermen, and that you must be actively in business at the time of application. So if for whatever reason you chose not to fish this year, um, you would not be eligible for this program. Also, uh, it's important that you have a uh, permit or license to trade or sell that fish to a seafood dealer, a licensed seafood dealer or wholesaler. That's, that's critical. Uh, I have a number of folks asking, well, hey, um, this person happens to have a commercial license to fish, but they don't have a permit to land. That's crucial there. Uh, it's important that you have a permit to land your fish. And it's also, um, we're limiting the program to fish that are caught in uh, U.S. waters uh, out to the uh, EEZ and including any waters that are covered by treaties between the United States and Canada. Just to make sure that we, if folks have that question, you know, where are we looking at? Uh, what, any other questions I, you can think of uh, on this area? Yeah, I, I've just got a quick question for you. You mentioned EEZ. What does that stand for? That's an exclusive economic zone, which is uh, strictly limited to U.S. fishermen. Uh, we do allow foreign ships to pass th through there for friendly passage, but that, that is recognized internationally as our zone where our, our commercial fishermen are allowed to harvest seafood. Okay, okay. Um, another question for you. Let's say that uh, I'm... I'm an LLC, not mm -hmm. an individual fisherman. Would I be, would the LLC be eligible to apply for seafood program? That's a really good question, yes. So um, similar to our other programs, we take a look at how is the operation formed? Is it uh, an ent is it a operation that's owned by one lone individual? So is it an individual? Or does it happen to be an entity that's made up of a sole proprietor or uh, an entity that has multiple members? And if it's actually an entity, then it should be the entity that is applying for the program. Now, if it's an informal partnership, then that would require each individual partner to apply and they should report their pounds that are attributed to them. If it was okay. a formal so, partnership, then the, it would just be the, the general partnership that would apply. Okay. Understood. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, one more question before we go further. You said commercial fishermen. So is there a, a particular definition of commercial fishing? Um, is, is that 
fishing that's intended uh, for just the sale of fish, or could it be for trade or transfer? It could be for trade or transfer. Uh, specifically, we we utilize the definition that's recognized by NOAA as what commercial fishing is, and that is where it is the harvest of seafood, and it is specifically for um, the sale or trade of fish to a seafood dealer, or it could even be uh, a processor, with, which could include folks uh, transfer on sea of that harvested seafood. Okay. Okay. This 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 helps. Um, just really trying to think of different questions that folks may have, um, and we may cover this on on a slide that's coming up. But I just wanted to ask, um, what about um, aquaculture? Okay. Uh, for this program, aquaculture is not included that uh, the only species that we are allowing under an aquaculture situation would be salmon and gooey ducks. Now for folks who right. may have called in that are aquaculture fishermen, there may be other programs that we have available that address your needs. Unfortunately, it's not this one. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. So tell us a little bit about the actual eligibility here. You know, are, are there pay limits? Um, tell us a yes. little bit more about that. Yes. So all of our programs, we have a form of payment limitation. In this particular program, it's limited to 200000 per person, and that's for all of the seafood species listed. So if you happen to be a fisherman of crab, salmon, and uh, pollock, then uh, and your <clears throat> excuse me your overall estimated payment wound up being three hundred thousand. It would actually be reduced back down to two hundred and fifty thousand. Uh, likewise, that limit is also um, it's per individual per legal entity. Now, if it's a partnership, we take a look and see how many individuals are involved because we consider each part, we may consider each partner an actual uh, person that's also entitled. So if Latrice and I had a fishing operation and we're partners and we have 50-50 share, then um, her limit would be 250000 and my limit would be 250000 but as you can see, as individuals, that's how it would be. However, if we were a corporation or, or um, uh, like an S corporation, that's how a lot of family fishing operations are set up, that um, that limit would be strictly 250000 because we see the corporation as the person, no matter whether there's a, a sole shareholder or if there's 10 shareholders. The other thing to keep in mind is we also have um, a certification for adjusted gross income. It cannot exceed, on average, 900000 And we look at the tax years for 2016, 17, and 2018. Should someone's adjusted gross income exceed 900000 they can certify that 75% of their income is either derived from farming, ranching, or forestry, and including seafood production or other related activities. And another important part is you must be a U.S. citizen in order to participate in this program. Okay, uh, just uh, a question for you to clarify here. You mentioned uh, that they could certify if they made more than if they exceeded the nine hundred thousand. Yep. Um, what do you mean when you say certify? What does that mean? So, in addition to the actual application form, uh, the application form for the program that's a program application, but then we have payment eligibility forms, and one of those includes a form called CCC 941, and that's certification of adjusted gross income and authorization to um, verify that information with the IRS. That form is required of everyone that applies for this program, even if you did not um, submit 
a tax return, you're going to have to do that. If you don't, while you may qualify for the program, you won't be able to get paid if we don't have that certification on file. And it's important to note that that form has to also be submitted to uh, the county office or a county office within 60 days after you submitting your application. Okay. Okay. And and don't worry, everyone uh, that's listening in, we are going to cover forms. I know you're wondering, like, what is she talking about? What form? What CCC? We're going to cover forms a little bit later. Yeah. Right now, I really just wanted to make sure that we had a general understanding of what she meant when she said certify. Okay. And you must be a U.S. citizen. And right. something else that you mentioned on the prior slide was that you had to be in business at the time of the application. And when you say in business, I just want to clarify, again, we are talking about commercial fishermen. So this program is for those who are actively commercial fishermen and are in business, correct? That's correct. Now, it's very possible that we have fishermen that their their season for whatever species they they harvest their season's over with that's okay you can still apply we're looking at that you were active for the um calendar year of 2020 wonderful okay so what do we have here on this slide kelly these are all of the eligible seafood types that were determined to have had a market loss that exceeded $5 million. Uh, you can see that we have uh, Aca mackerel, and then we have Dungeness crab, king crab, snow crab, and southern tanner crab, flounder, gooey ducks, goosefish, herrings, lobster, Pacific cod, Pacific ocean perch, pollock, sablefish, salmon, sole, squid, tunas, and turbot. So um, just to give you an example there where you see tunas, yes, we're talking all different uh, types of tunas. Uh, likewise, with lobster, we're looking at American lobster and uh, the spiny lobster. Uh, one, the other thing that you'll note in, in the point there where we state this um, is for U.S. caught and sold seafood. So uh, it shouldn't be any seafood that was caught elsewhere outside of our uh, U.S. waters. Likewise, um, it <clears throat> cannot be seafood that was caught by a foreign ship and then somebody else happened to have it and then turns over and sells it. We're not counting that. That, that should not be included on the application. But uh, notably, these are all wild caught with the exception that it can also include uh, gooey ducks and salmon that may be reared. I, I want to make sure that folks understand we're talking about reared for sale to eat, not in terms of stocking uh, a particular area. And as so I mentioned this slide before, is, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask. No, no, I was just going to ask you, on this slide, it's talking a little bit more about eligibility. If you could just um, tell, tell me a little bit more about the, the treaty here. Uh, this talks a little sure. bit about Canadian waters. Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, there's a number of U.S. Uh, vessels that um, fish in Canadian waters, and in this particular treaty, we're talking about um, vessels that uh, are fishing albacore tuna, and if there are other species listed under that, that treaty, it, it'll be known. But it also allows these boats port privileges in Canadian uh, ports. So that, even though that fish uh, is caught on a U.S. vessel, if it's commercially sold or traded back to, uh, to somebody on a Canadian dock, and it's reported back to NOAA that way, those pounds would count under this program. We would count that as an eligible U.S. caught seafood. Okay, I, I see a note there that says direct personal sales or transfers to unlicensed seafood dealers are not eligible for this program. That's um, correct. I think that's something, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah. That's a key it's point. Important. 
it's important to note because um, there's a number of folks that do uh, direct sales and uh, sometimes some folks call it uh, over the rail sales, say for like lobster, or if they're selling directly um, to a restaurant or a grocery store. Uh, if they're not a licensed seafood dealer or a wholesaler, then that production cannot be counted under this program. Also, if it's production that was caught for personal use um, and in some areas for what we call uh, sustenance community use, that's also not considered commercial seafood. Okay, that's good information to know. Um, before we go a little bit further, I have one more question about this. Um, you mentioned earlier about certification, and maybe we'll talk about that later. I don't want to jump ahead. I'll, I'll wait and see if we talk about that a little later. Well, we could probably do it right here. Okay. So this. This is our form that we have for someone to apply. And it's also, um, you can see you can get that form at our farmers.gov forward slash seafood website. Uh, I can share with the group that in the near future, we will have an entire uh, seafood application package. So that will include additional documents or forms rather that uh, are necessary for your payment eligibility. Um, not sure if ever, how how big that is for everybody, but it's quite simple. You're going to put the name of the operation or the individual that's doing business and the address. You're going to include their point of contact and please include a phone number. It's critical. Uh, we're aware that some folks may not have internet service, so uh, often the best way for us to reach folks on an immediate need basis is by phone. And down below where we're certifying, meaning that you don't have to have actual production evidence to submit at the time of application. But understand that it may be requested by our county committee um, that oversees our programs um, just to verify it. Uh, and reasons why we would do that would be uh, if they saw something that was out of the norm or unusual. But anyway, you would put, say, for um, crabs, you would designate Dungeness crabs, if that's what you had, and then you would enter in the pounds that are attributed to your operation. So it could be 450,000 pounds, and and that's all that would be needed. We wouldn't, we're not requiring you to actually submit something. That's what a certification is. And just below that is the certification agreement where an individual would sign and submit that document to any county office. So, Kelly, what you're saying is basically a fisherman is self-certifying, um, certifying that this information is true, that this, you gave the example of crabs, but they're saying that I had this amount of crabs, and basically that's it unless the county committee should request additional information? Yes. So um, it could be that they request it so that they can make an accurate determination, or it could be that even after the application was approved and paid, that uh, they're part of a spot check process because we spot check on all of our programs and we will be doing it on this one. So that means what you certify to, uh, you, are, you have documentation that can back up that number. Now certainly if somebody under certified and their production showed that it was actually greater than that, there's not going to be an issue there. It would be if what they certified to is greater than the documentation they provide or worse if they weren't able to provide us any documentation then we would have to collect that difference back. And Understood. it's really important okay. to remember that those documents, they should keep those on file for up to three years after we apply, or sorry, after they apply. Okay, okay. And one more question before we move off the application. So if I had, um, and I'm, I'm just saying this off the top of my head, but let's say that I had, uh, crabs and salmon. Would I do one application for crabs and then one application for salmon? 
No, you're going to put that all on one form. And if you happen to have more than three species that you fish for, just get another form and, and submit it all at once. The way we actually process it in our system, it will come out and uh, show up as one form. So it's, if you didn't pre-fill something out and you happen to be able to work with someone online, they would complete that and you would see one full form and it would show each specific seafood type and uh, the pounds uh, associated with it. Okay, great. So the most important part that I'm sure everyone's wanting to know, um, how is payment calculated for this program? It, it's a simple formula. So for each variety, you're going to take the pounds and multiply it by the applicable uh, payment rate that's associated with it. So for like lobsters, I believe it's 50 cents a pound. So you take your pounds times your payment rate, and that comes up with your calculated gross payment. And I say gross payment because it's possible that that payment will get reduced, as I mentioned before about the payment limitation. Or you could happen to have a member of your entity that hasn't submitted their payment eligibility paperwork, um, whereas somebody else in the entity could have. That means that payment would have to get redu reduced by that ineligible member's share. So it, once again, uh, Latrice, if you and I were partners and I failed to turn in my payment eligibility paperwork, then our, the payment would actually get reduced by 50%. Oh, wow. And could you remind our fishermen one more time, what is that payment limitation FSA has? 250000 per person or legal person. entity. Yes. Okay, great. So here are the rates uh, for the different seafood, rates per pound. Um, yeah, I can share a little bit about that. Those rates were based upon, once again, if the if folks take a look at the notice of funds availability, and by the way, there's a link to that on our farmers.gov forward slash seafood website, um, that, that loss is calculated based upon their market loss for that specific seafood species. So some of them may have had a loss that, ex that was much greater than uh, 5 million, uh, some of them may be close to that, and also taking into consideration the actual amount harvested in 2019 when compared to 2017. And that's why you'll see the different rates uh, associated with each specific seafood variety. Okay. And, and you can see um, a number, uh, uh, I know one of the questions I'll get about some of these rates is such as Pollock. Why are we paying a penny a pound? Well, first of all, it goes back again to how big of a loss it was. It certainly exceeded five million, but it very well could be based upon the amount of pounds in comparison for that particular year. It just equates out to that. I, I still encourage folks, if you certainly if you fish even more than Pollock, go ahead and apply. It it's it, and include that if that's what you you actually fish. And I will let you know that in the payment calculation, we do uh, we do pay um, <clears throat> on the nearest whole dollar. So if if you're gonna have you know ten thousand pounds, that's at least a hundred dollars that you got right there. Mhm. Mm and okay. I'm talking Pollock <laughs> in that case. <laughs> Okay, well, we've got an, an example here. Um, if you don't mind going over this um, example, let's see. Sure, sure. So in this particular one, we have um, Fisherman Alex, and he commercially harvested 375,000 pounds. So he didn't, uh, and I want to point out, folks, he didn't just harvest it. He actually sold that, sold it or traded it in 2019 and he's a sole proprietor of this operation so he reports his 375,000 pounds and the applicable payment rate for salmon is 16 cents per pound which calculates out to be a $60,000 sea trap payment and he would get if he meets all the other payment eligibility criteria he's going to get all $60,000 
what they do with that payment once they receive it, that's up to them. We do not get, uh, we're not concerned about what they do with it afterwards. Okay, well, I want to play a twist on this. Let's say that Alex um, only has half interest in the operation. Let's say he has 50% ownership interest. What impact would that make on this example we have here? What would change? So if Alex was um, a fisherman and it was at 50%, uh, I would want to make sure that the 375,000 pounds that he's certifying to is actually his share of 50%. Is it, <laughs> excuse me, is it actually 375 or is it supposed to be half of that? Okay. Does that make sense okay. to you? It does. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so if, if he is in a, uh, if he has 50% ownership interest, let's just say that his portion was half of that, I just want to make sure that it's understood that uh, half of the 375 is what would be used for this this payment example. It would be that times the 16 cents. Yeah. Um, and yeah. One, thing, one thing that is important to know about these payments is that uh, FSA does pay in dollars and cents. Uh, I just wanted to um, repeat that, dollars and cents for these. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I got that confused where it, it'll pay at least a dollar if it calculates up to that. And I want right. to, going, right. in going back to that slide, if you don't mind real quick, just to let folks know, yeah, back at this example, um, keep in mind, Alex, could be if he's a, a member of an entity um, that that does operation, that and that's 375,000 pounds represents the entire entity. The application should be made in the entity's name for that amount. That's all I wanted to let you okay. know. Okay. 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 That's a good point. Thank you. Okay, this is going back to, I believe, what you said earlier about the certification. Um, can you remind us again about the, the record keeping? Yes. Um, so once again, it's important to keep your records for up to three years after you apply for the CTRAP program that uh, USDA will be conducting spot checks. You may be asked for the supporting documentation just to show that the production is reasonable and that you are indeed an active fisherman for the 2020 season. Uh, I know we're asking for information from the 2019 harvest, but we may actually ask you, do you have a, a permit to fish for 2020? Since um, yeah. we, and, and I wanted to let folks know that uh, while this information may be new to us, uh, the Reviewing records is is what our county committee members and county office staff have been doing for decades. And if we feel the need that we have to um, have some experts come in, then we're going to reach out to state fishery officials and or uh, sea grant extension agents as well. Okay. A couple of questions before we leave this slide. So these these documents you men, you mentioned the production records that we need to keep and be able to provide should we be selected for a spot check. Uh, will any of these documents be required at the time that uh, application is submitted or is this just uh, after the process? When I apply or when a fisherman applies, do I have to have all of these records or you know, documentation of production at the time I apply? No, you do not have to have it at the time that you apply. Certainly, if you do have it, it never hurts to provide us with that information. Um, if you can provide a copy, or we'll, we'll certainly uh, make a cop photocopy of it and return it back to the individual. There are some states, though, that actually keep some of this information available to the public. So some field offices will be able to have direct access to it. An example being like Alaska Fisheries, they they show who has a permit and what the pounds were that were caught. Oh, okay. 
but that varies state by state, and it's really important that um, folks know that um, that's why we ask that sh you should have that information available because uh, there are states that have their own Privacy Act laws that protect fishermen, and um, that information cannot be released in some cases to third parties without the fisherman's specific permission. Okay. Uh, another question I, I had for you, um, and you may not be able to answer this in detail right now today because I know the, um, the sign-up period is just starting and we are identifying different nuances in different places, but I just wanted to mention that I know with some tribal fishermen, uh, they are not required to uh, file tax returns. Um, they're not able to, to file tax returns, but it could be that they're selected for a spot check. If they're selected for a spot check and they don't have evidence or able to, if they're not able to provide some of this documentation um, of their actual production, how will that be handled? Um, is that something that FSA would be willing to work with for tribal producers? Um, and I know it's going to vary in different states and in different cases, but uh, just in case we do have some on the phone right now, I don't want anyone to be uh, discouraged from applying. Uh, is that something that they need to address now at application time? or? Yeah, well, it's a great question, Latrice. First of all, I want to assure everyone that's joined us that um, when there's a, a problem, uh, FSA looks at each situation on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and, and to address, um, one of the things I'm aware of is some, um, some Indian tribes, those that are federally recognized uh, and members of tribes are not necessarily required to file, say, like an income tax return with IRS. We still will need you to certify to your adjusted gross income, and if IRS comes back and says, hey, you don't have that on file, um, since they're a federally recognized tribe, they would still be eligible uh, under the AGI provisions. We, we make note of it in their record and record it as such in our system. In terms of production, it very well could be that their production is either maintained by um, the, the tribe uh, tribal association, because it could be that the permit is issued to the tribal association, or it could be that individual. Um, uh, once again, if they didn't happen to have that, it, it would just be, a, uh, or they couldn't locate it possibly. We'd always say if there's a problem, um, make sure that you present your case. It's really important that you respond to any correspondence from FSA if there's a question in the matter. Um, I, I always recommend, uh, certainly a phone call helps, but um, nothing beats the written word. It's always important. It, it benefits you as well as the agency when you can document it in writing. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I do want, as you said, Latrice, I want to encourage everyone, if you think you're eligible, definitely apply for this program. Don't, don't think that uh, because we may not have answered all your questions that that, that should prevent you from applying. Um, I, I can assure you that uh, we make a point of accepting applications. We certainly don't want folks <clears throat> applying um, just for the sake of it. We, we want eligible folks to apply, but when when in doubt, um, do, don't take the, uh, the method of, no, I'm not going to do it. It's because it's so much easier to address an application that's timely submitted than one that is submitted after the deadline. The, that's when it can become problematic. Okay. And you know, that's that's really why we're really encouraging folks to use the call center line, the call line where you can call in and get help. Um, it's beyond just calling to ask a question. Uh, the employees at the call center are actually able to assist you um, with the paperwork. They're help, 
they can help you uh, reach out to your county office and set appointments. So uh, it's very important if you have any kind of question at all, feel free to call or contact the, the call care center. We're going to give that number and where to find that a little bit later. Kelly, just really quick, I wanted you to uh, tell us a little bit about these forms that are needed to apply. Sure. Um, so once again, it's always important to make sure you get the your CTRAP application in, but these are some supporting documents that you may need to complete because we, we anticipate the vast majority of our applicants will be brand new customers to Farm Service Agency and they're what we use to establish a business partner record. So uh, first of all, uh, the application on certifying with compliance of their payment limit uh, is a CCC 902. That's actually a, a, a summary of how their operation is set up. If it's for an individual, it would be a CCC 902I. Um, if it's for an entity, it'll be a 902E. Uh, if they happen to visit the center, the, the um, service center, they'll be able to provide them with that. But on these forms, we only ask that you complete parts A and B, which is going to state um, your name and address and whether you are a U.S. citizen. Um, the other parts, that tends to pertain more to capital equipment, and that's not necessary for this program. Then the CCC 901, that's a member information form. That's only required if somebody is applying as an entity. I mentioned the CCC 941, that's the Certification of Adjusted Gross Income and um, authorization to uh, verify that information with the IRS. Should that individual certify that their adjusted gross income exceeds 900000 then they're going to want to complete the CCC 942 certification of income. And while it says from farming, ranching, and forestry operations, we're including seafood heart, uh, production and related activities. It's important to note that that form not only needs to have your certification, you need to have either your um, accountant or attorney certify to that, that statement that 75% that of your income is derived from those type of um, operate, uh, actions. For okay. 20, yeah, and it, this is an important form that um, I want to make sure our folks, it, while it's an optional form, it's really important that we capture if. Uh, from a strictly a voluntary basis on the applicant. It's uh, capturing, uh, be it gender, race, or ethnicity. Um, it's certainly not a requirement for program participation. I, I want folks to understand that. But it's information that it, it must be volunteered and is not to be observed by, by our staff. So it's, but it's the form that we, we use for that. And for our new customers, then we also ask that you complete form AD2047. That's what helps us create your business partner record. And I, I know that sounds, uh, that's certainly like a laundry list of forms. Here's the best part. Once you've filed that stuff, we don't ask you to submit it again unless you feel it's necessary to update any operational changes. And it also um, lets us know that not only you're now uh, uh, an existing FSA customer and it allows you to apply for other programs in the future. Okay. I know that some of these forms are electronically generated from FSA offices, but as far as uh, the other forms, uh, are these all available online? Yes, they are. And as I stated before, we'll be updating our farmers.gov seafood site so that there will mm -hmm. be uh, a CTRAP application package. Also, if you call the call center and provide them with your name and address, they'll, they'll provide you with all of these forms, and it'll include instructions on how to complete them and where to submit those forms back to. Okay, and just one other form that I didn't see or didn't hear you mention, but in my opinion, it would be the most important. Um, is there any kind of direct deposit form? Uh, how would I get my payment? if I applied for this program? So um, while direct deposit 
is not a requirement. Um, it's simple enough to request that. It's on a form, I believe it's SF3118. Uh, I'm going to need somebody to verify that for me uh, before we end this call so folks know. But even if we don't have it here, I can tell you that um, just about any financial institution is familiar with the direct deposit form, and it's as simple as uh, you can either uh, include your bank routing and account information from uh, a avoided check or even a, a deposit slip if it has that ACH number uh, on there, we can use that. Or you can take it to your local bank and they can complete that form for you and certify that it's correct. So when you provide that to us, once we um, make payment, uh, we set that up in our, our records and if your application is approved, the payment is certified and signed and you can see that payment show up in your account uh, within excuse me, two to three business days, as opposed to mail, which can take up to 10 days. And we're very aware with, um, particularly some of our Alaska fishermen, um, mail services, you know, that's, that's weather permitting in some areas. So it, it could be even longer than that. That's why we strongly encourage you to utilize the direct deposit. It also makes it easier for us to track a payment should there be an issue. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Kelly. Um, again, as we've mentioned before, everyone, you are able to apply either in person, you're able to mail it as long as it's postmarked by December 14th, uh, but you're also able to submit all of these forms in your application electronically to the county office that serves your area. Um, there's a software or there's a, a program called Box and One Span. Kelly, can you briefly tell us what is Box One Span? Yes, so Box allows for us to have forms <clears throat> sent to the applicants. And what One Span allows is it allows the user to actually um, electronically sign those documents and submit them back to the the field office where they came from. Uh, it, it, right. The the best part about that is that it doesn't it doesn't cost anybody anything for that other than their time. Honestly, uh, you you avoid postage, you avoid any kind of time delay, and it also show with it with it being time and date stamp, it clearly shows when you submitted an application. Okay, that's that's good to know because I know, especially with uh, COVID-19 concerns, a lot of people are uh, timid or shy about making those in-person appointments. So this is something that you can do without even leaving your home. You're able to submit it electronically online using these resources. And all of these resources and information about them are available on farmers.gov forward slash seafood website. So as we round out to, to complete this and, and just give you a final overview of the um, resources that are available, the slide says, what happens after I sign my application? So it's important to remember that uh, there are 60 days from signing that application to resolve any issues or submit any additional uh, requests that the county office provides or, or a request from you. Um, I want to make sure, is that correct, Kelly? Uh, they do have 60 days from the date they sign the application. Is that correct? Yes, it's important. So that um, if they miss that deadline, it could jeopardize their payment. Uh, it doesn't necessarily jeopardize the uh, review and approval of their their actual application for the program, but it could impact the the payment. So I, I just want folks to understand that we we take a look at your application for the program separate from your payment eligibility documents. Okay, great, great. So that, that tells you um, what happens after you sign the application. We want to leave you with uh, some information about some available resources. Um, if 
you were to visit one of our county offices by appointment only, there are some that are open by appointments one-on-one, -on -one, you are able to request language interpretation if English is not your primary language. So you can go into that office. Uh, there are some I Speak flyers in every uh, USDA service center where you are able to point and identify which language you need. From there, the service center staff will contact the interpreter via telephone and there will be an interpreter on the line to um, translate for you and that employee over the speakerphone. So that's something we want you to know that is available in every USDA service center, every office across the country. Farmers.gov resources, we, all day we've talked about um, Farmers.gov, far, Farmers.gov. That is the website for all information on programs uh, that impact farmers and ranchers. And yes, you too, fishermen. This is where we have our information on the seafood program. So it's Farmers.gov and then forward slash the word seafood. There you'll be able to find a fact sheet that has, it's a quick front and back fact sheet that provides information about this program. It's easy for you to use and easy for you to share. If you're calling or if you're participating today from an organization, we do ask that you share that fact sheet with uh, potential uh, interested fishermen or other folks who are in the uh, in different seafood or marine fisheries industries, make sure that they share that fact sheet. Uh, there's a frequently asked questions document that will be updated periodically. Uh, it has a lot of questions that uh, fishermen have, may have, um, based on some of our conversations and our webinars, we will update that, that document to make sure that some of your questions that some of you may have asked today, they may be entered on that, that sheet. So please visit that. That's also on the farmers.gov forward slash uh, seafood website. The notice of funds availability, I just wanted to explain that. That's something that's also on the website. Whenever a federal program is rolled out, uh, the agency notifies the public of that program, of the funds that are available through that program, who will be implementing it, and there's usually a period of time in which the public is able to uh, either comment or able to uh, provide some feedback on the program. This is called a notice of funding availability. So a copy of that notice is also on the website. Uh, most, most of the time it includes a cost benefit analysis that tells you how the program came to be, how the payment calculations were made. That's on the website. The call center phone number. We have uh, discussed that um, today several times, that is a hotline that I think is very important uh, that you know that you can use at any time. It's available, I believe, from 8 to 8. Uh, that's East, Eastern time. Uh, you are able to connect with a live employee who's able to provide one-on-one -on -one assistance and answer questions. Questions that you may not have been able to get answered today, call that hotline they will be able to assist you and answer questions as well. The office locator is also located online, as well as a link to the recorded webinars. If you feel that there are others who may benefit from this webinar that we've held today, it is being recorded. Uh, there will be a recording available as well as the presentation slides that will be posted on the webinar page. We really hope that this is something that has been beneficial to you. Uh, you may have received an invite through a forward, forward or an email message from a colleague, but if you'd like to receive updates directly from the Farm Service Agency's outreach and education staff, feel free to sign up for our alerts, our newsletters at fsa.usda forward slash subscribe. You'll enter your email information and then you'll select outreach and education to subscribe to our alerts. And of course, we want to hear your feedback on how this webinar was. Was it informative for you? Did it answer any of your questions? Uh, how can we improve? Let us know and, and provide us with some feedback.
Again, thanks so much for being with us today. I want to say again thank you to our colleague Kelly Dawson, the program manager, for being with us and answering questions. And of course, we are always thankful to have our administrator with us, Richard Fordyce. So signing off for now, thanks so much for joining us. Take care and be safe.